Over the past two years, I've had the great pleasure to put together a really fabulous edit, edited collection, which just published in August of 2019. The book is called The Research Handbook on Child Soldiers, and the publishers are Edward Elger Press. And this book forms part of its uh, research handbooks in international law series. And we're very happy that it forms part of that particular series because yes, the book is about international law, but it's actually a book that brings forward a broad variety of perspectives from other fields that help inform international law. Um, I had the joy of putting this together with a co-editor, Justine Barrett, who I have become acquainted with through our mutual work with children affected by armed conflict. Uh, Justine has done a lot of work with children who were involved in genocide in Rwanda, both as perpetrators and as victims. And we were able to very fruitfully join together um, our backgrounds, thinking about child soldiering in a theoretical perspective, and also trying to remedy child soldiering in a very, very practical context. So child soldiering is a phenomenon that has occurred throughout all of history. And in this particular space and place we occupy now in the era of international law and international institutions, in recent decades an important shift has occurred. And that shift has involved the application of law and policy towards the phenomenon of children who become associated with armed groups and armed forces. Historically, when children were deployed in armed conflict, they were deployed out of a sense of necessity and generally out of a sense of desperation. Their involvement, however, may have been seen as both despondent, but also heroic in a sense. And there's many instances of children who had become involved in military violence afterwards being feted or lauded for their martial pride and commitment. But as I mentioned before, we're now in a space and place of law and policy with deep international roots and child soldiering increasingly is seen as a scourge, as something that is both legally and morally unacceptable. And we have advanced towards a position where international understandings of child soldiering involve the baseline age of 18, coupled with a very broad understanding of what association with armed forces or armed group means. Uh, children under the age of 18 who fight and carry weapons are child soldiers. So too are children who serve as porters, spies, sentries, uh, saboteurs, who cook and clean, and also children who serve as coerced uh, matrimonial partners in forced marriages, and also children who serve um, in absolutely wretched situations of sexual slavery. So why a new book on a topic that has received a lot of attention? And I think the reasons are two in number. Notwithstanding the um, media, academic, policy, and practice interest that combating child soldiering has acquired in terms of traction, the reality is the scourge of child soldiering still persists. And one of the reasons that scourge still persists relates to the reality that child soldiering is not necessarily well understood. And one of the reasons child soldiering is not well understood is that we, in many instances, have paid insufficient attention to the voices of the children themselves. So one goal that we like to accomplish in this book and why we feel a new book is in order is to give voice to the perspectives of children who have become entangled with and enmeshed with um, armed conflict. Our second major goal maps onto what we had seen as the second major need for a new book in this area and that is to stitch together, to weave together a global narrative, a global tapestry of voices on child soldiering. I mentioned earlier it's important to us to feature the voices of the children themselves and secondarily it's very important for us to bring together a diverse array
of um, experiences, expertise, and um, knowledge bases with regards to child soldiering. And when we say diverse, we mean it in a global sense, and we also mean it in a sense of how to think about child soldiering. And in this particular project, we have assembled nearly 30 experts from a broad variety of disciplines, um, a broad variety of perspectives, law, economics, uh, psychology, literary studies, political science, anthropology, and also a number of individuals who approach the subject matter from practitioner and practice-based experiences. Moreover, we have voices in the book that are from six continents. And this underscores to us another major need in studying and understanding child soldiering, which is to recognize it as a global phenomenon, as a global uh, issue that affects uh, children on all continents. And this is important, we feel, because historically, child soldiering has tended to focus around this one image of uh, the African boy, often very young, prepubescent, barely able to carry any weaponry. And yes, such children are child soldiers. But in reality, the phenomenon is vastly more diverse, touching young people under the age of 18 on every continent. And as a result, in order to avoid sensationalizing and Africanizing a problem that is global in scope, uh, we built a community of perspectives that reflects the universal nature of child soldiering, while at the same time trying to render more sophisticated the need to universally condemn the practice. And in order to achieve that, the perspectives of the children actually need to be listened to. Children need to be given a space to speak up, not to be spoken down to. Our sense was the best way to achieve both of those goals, goals of diversity of voices, goals that focused on the resilience and energy of young people, was not to speak with one authorial voice, not to speak from the perspectives of one individual. So together with a co-editor, Justine Barrett, who's a long-standing practitioner with regards to international children's rights, we decided a phenomenal way to go forward would be to build an edited collection that imbued the entire process of the book development um, stage with a broad variety of voices. So what are some of the takeaways from the book? And I can think of five important takeaways that we feel the book uh, helps catalyze and helps bring to a broader form of public attention. And the first, uh, child soldiering is as much about resilience and strength as it is about pain and depredation. And by this we mean that the most successful programs of reintegration, reintegrating children affected by military violence, to bring back into society children who have suffered in times of war and conflict, is to acknowledge the pain these children have su suffered, but to emphasize their potentiality, their humanity as young people, and their capacities to participate in the rebuilding of not only their own societies, but also themselves in the process of dealing with a post-conflict transition to civilian life. So one of the major takeaways from our book is one can speak of child soldiering with the empathy to recognize the pain, but then do so with an upbeat, uplifting, optimistic cadence that emphasizes capacity strength and potentiality. Our second major takeaway that we think is crucially important uh, for um, readers and why we think the book is, is, is of great salience in this regard. And that second main takeaway is the reality that um, children become entangled in um, armed conflict, become enmeshed with armed groups, and become immersed in armed forces 
for a variety of different reasons. Some children are abducted and kidnapped, but the majority of children who become involved in armed conflict enlist. That means they come forward and on their own initiative um, decide to join. Now, of course, their own initiative is heavily limited by poverty, desperation, abusive families, uh, limited choice in how to build a future, and then one becomes drawn to militarization. But some of these children join because they believe in a political cause. They want to defend their communities. They want politically to build a better world, and in some places where the franchise or the democratic process is stultified, one of the only ways to build a better world is through the deployment of violence. And what we feel is important is recognizing the broad spectrum of realities and motivations of child soldiers, how children become involved, because without recognizing that, without individuating the individual child's path to military life. We cannot build a successful program of both reintegration or understanding. And one can't stop the phenomenon of child soldiering without understanding why and how children become involved in this practice. Moreover, this we see as particularly salient today in the third major goal that we would like to extract from the book, which is to recognize that child soldiering today not only takes a diversity of forms, but also falls under a broader spectrum of language categories. One of the most challenging um, uh, sort of obstacles I think we face today is to think about how to speak of the child who becomes involved with terrorist groups. For example, Al-Qaeda, um, the Islamic State. Uh, thousands of children have crossed international borders to join the uh, Islamic State, for example, ISIS. Some have done so by demonstrating tremendous enterprise and free will in joining the group. Others have been kidnapped and brutalized. However they enter the group in the first place, these children become subject to horrific brainwashing and at times have been deployed to commit ghastly violence, for example, beheadings, killings of prisoners, and so forth. It's crucially important to us to recognize that the definition of child soldiering expands and applies and should apply as a matter of law to child terrorists and children involved in violent extremist groups. We feel it's crucially important also to extend a conversation and extend our knowledge base about what we have learned from child soldiers and extend it not only to child terrorists, but also to children who have become involved in gang activity, drug cartels, uh, transnational drug and sex trafficking, uh, transnational labor that is dangerous in nature. We argue in the book, through the voices of our interlocutors and authors, that there are tremendous similarities between how children join armed forces as to how children may become recruited into criminal gangs, drug syndicates, um, and a variety of other organized criminal cartels. And we feel that there is a valuable learning lesson to extend the knowledge base about child soldiering into these other contexts. The fourth major takeaway that we think is very salient from this book is to think critically and to think carefully and to think wisely about uh, girls who become implicated and enmeshed in armed groups and into armed forces and into criminal syndicates and into terrorist groups. The stereotype of the child soldier is, as I mentioned earlier, a young African boy and even if we extend beyond the kernel of the stereotype, the idea of the child soldier still remains deeply masculinized, still remains deeply focused on boys and young men. But globally speaking, 40% of child soldiers are girls.
And what we sought to do in this book is mainstream the gender perspective and a gender-based analysis within the overall conversation of child soldiering. And this leads to two or three very important smaller takeaways on the gender points. First of all, girls who soldier occupy a multiplicity of roles. Yes, many are sex slaves and forced conjugal partners and experience the child soldiering context through that particularly wretched lens. Other girls, however, carry weapons, fight, may lead military units, may actually become involved in the child soldiering experience for purposes of personal emancipation, political liberation, to fight for a cause. And in some instances, a forcibly married girl may also carry a weapon and may both turn to armed conflict as a space to actualize a political agenda while also being subjected to and subjugated by a forced marriage relationship or sexual violence. And the second major aspect that we feel is very important about opening a conversation about girl soldiers is that in armed groups where practices of forced marriage, where practices of sexual slavery exist, one of the realities is for many girl soldiers, the girl soldiering experience turns into a mothering experience. And many of these girl soldiers, while associated with the armed group, may become mothers. They may give birth to children, and their children, often conceived out of a crime, often conceived out of forced marriage, conceived out of rape, conceived out of sexual violence, their children then become associated themselves with the armed group and therefore grow up within this particular context. And we feel by focusing on the girl soldier experience, this opens the door to a broader conversation of probably the most vulnerable members of armed groups, namely the very young children born out of individuals who are held captive. And on this note, we also feel and are very proud of some of the contributions in our book that actually take a very careful read of the forced marriage situation and explore a question that has received incredibly little attention. Namely, what about husbands? What about men? And what about boys in forced marriage relationships? I opened the door to the conversation of forced marriage by talking about girls. But a forced marriage has two parties. And one is the girl and the other is the boy or the man. Now, stereotypically, the understanding of forced marriage is that powerful commanders in armed groups will subjugate multiple women as wives and will procreate with these multiple women. And certainly this is the case. And it is the case that leaders and powerful commanders do approach themselves the idea of forced marriage in this way. However, Many of these commanders and many of these groups also structure forced marriage as a social practice within the group. And these commanders are responsible for their own marriages, but assume responsibility over marriage forcibly as a social institution within the armed group. And this is in fact the majority of the ways in which forced marriage is practiced within this group. We actually have found that most men in forced marriage relationships are there coercively. They were forced into the marriage themselves. And many of these individuals themselves are boys, so are actually child soldiers. And a very interesting data set emerges as to their relationships with the women they were forcibly married to, their relationships with their children, to uh, while they were forced to procreate with their wives they were forcibly married to,
and also the reality that once conflict ends, many of these dually forced marriages that may have produced children remain family units in the aftermath of the violence. And in some instances, the men in forced marriage relationships, for example in northern Uganda, after they were forcibly married and became fathers, they fought less well, they fought less boldly, they were more conservative in how they fought and as a result were less effective fighters because they were motivated to greater restraint on the battlefield because of their own concerns of either self-preservation or being there as fathers for their own children. And I think that leads me to the fifth major takeaway from the book that is a crucial contribution that we hope to make. And that is to construct the child soldier as a complex character. To construct the child soldier as a character, as an individual that in reality occupies a multiplicity of different positions. And that means opening up a conversation to a very difficult topic. How to speak about and how to speak of individuals third parties, civilians, that have been hurt by violence undertaken by child soldiers. How to speak about the man, the woman, the child who has been attacked, brutalized, murdered by a child soldier. How to speak of that person's needs to achieve justice, while at the same time recognizing that the child who may have inflicted that violence, him or herself, is a victim. In times of war, in times of atrocity, victims often victimize others. The persecuted often persecutes. And we can't achieve an understanding of why atrocity happens, why human rights abuses occur, why mass crimes exist without recognizing that many perpetrators are deeply tragic in nature and many victims themselves may be imperfect. And until we achieve that level of nuance and subtlety, we won't move the bar forward very much, not only in terms of preventing child soldiering, but also preventing massive human rights abuses more generally. So our starting point was to think twice about child soldiers. And our ending point was actually to think three, four, five, or six times about a broader variety of issues. And to me, that is a successful project.